Okay, so you know C Sharp and Entity Framework. That is awesome. But what SQL questions do you need to know for a job interview? 255 has been deployed. 255 has been deployed. Hey, Come outside, have a cigarette, and celebrate with me. We finally deployed user story 255. Uh, I haven't smoked since the army. That stuff will kill you. Smoking is cool and good for you too. Don't let anyone tell you different. Listen. One day, scientists are going to find out that meetings actually cause heart attacks, and you can smoke, drink, and not exercise all you want. Come on. Come celebrate with me. You're the only person in this office that I can stand. All right. So you got plans for the weekend? My kid's with his good-for-nothing father this weekend, so it's all Sex in the City reboot and Riesling. How about you? I'm going back up to New Jersey. Uh, my dad has family coming in from Northern Ireland, so we're going to show him around Philadelphia, maybe take him to a Sixers game. That's my mom. Right there. Hey mom, Ryan, it's your mother. I, I know that your phone, the name comes up. Listen, phone. I need you to come up early tomorrow. Your father doesn't know how to join the I table. He doesn't to join the bloody table. He doesn't know how to join the table. My dad only knows how to framework. I know how to join the bloody table. He doesn't know how to join the table. Tell dad not to worry about it. I'll be there tomorrow. I love you. All right, I'll see you tomorrow. I love you. Okay, I'll, I'll come up early. I love you. So your father's Irish and your mother's Jewish. How were you raised? Mainly by a TRS-80. I'm okay, I promise. Alright, let's talk about SQL. Okay, now if you're a programmer and you already know an ORM like Entity Framework or N-Hibernate, you might be wondering why you even need to know straight SQL. Well, an ORM or Object Relational Mapper or like Entity Framework isn't for people who can't write SQL statements, it's for people who don't want to write SQL statements. Big difference. And if you're a C-sharp programmer like me, just about everything you do in code is gonna end up in a database. So if you're interviewing for a full stack developer position, you at least need to know the basics of SQL. And I'm gonna teach you that today. Now, before we get started, please like and subscribe. Think I'm right, think I'm wrong, leave a comment down below. And uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Now, if you want to follow along at home, the code for the Crap Tech database is going to be available on my GitHub or my website. So you just run this and it'll instantly populate the database and you can follow along. Now, I'm going to be running Microsoft SQL that I have on an Ubuntu Linux instance running in a Docker container. If you don't want to set up a whole SQL thing, you can just go to someplace like SQL Fiddle and just be sure that you check Microsoft SQL Server. You know, that way everything will import correctly. Now, when it comes to databases, everything starts with a good schema. Okay, so what is a schema? Well, it's an abstract design that visualizes the data and the tables that are in your database. Oftentimes, it is diagrammed out kind of like this. Now, you notice I said good schema. So there are good schemas and bad schemas. So what is a good schema? Well, generally, a good schema is normalized. So what's normalized? Well, normalization is the process of organizing your data, establishing good relationships, and eliminating redundancies in your tables. So you take a look at this thing, employee and employee type. You notice employee type doesn't have the employee name in it. Again, this helps normalize your data. Employee holds names, employee type just holds types. And best of all, this table has good relationships. So right here, you have the job code. This job code in employee refers to the job code in the employee type table, and it can refer to the job name. Now, here's what's cool about that. That means you don't have to put the job name in the employee table where it probably doesn't belong. Okay, so there's all this talk about tables. So what is a table? Well, a table is an object representation of data in a database. In the case of Microsoft SQL, if you want to view your tables, you can go to the actual database, open, in this case, it's CrapTech, open up the database. There'll be a folder called tables. You can open that up and you'll see every single table that exists in your database. So how do we get data from these tables? Well, that's what the select statement, and you're probably going to be using this a lot. So how do we actually do a select from a table? Well, I'm going to do a select all columns and every single record in this employee table right here. So go up to new query and say select asterisk, which means all columns from employee. 
And Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio will notice that you're typing in a table. It should auto-complete for you. So you can just hit tab right there. Now, once you've got that select statement written out, you can either hit the execute uh, play button there or hit F5. And there's every single column and every single record in the employee table. Now, one thing to note, and this is probably going to be an interview question, the language SQL is case insensitive. So select like this will work exactly the same as an uppercase select. Okay, now remember, this asterisk here means all columns, so every single column in the table. What if you just want the first name and last name? Well, you can see here, there's a column called first name and a column called last name. So to get that information, you just replace this asterisk with first name, and that should come up, and last name. And if you hit F5, now you just have the first name and the last name. Now, let's say you want to get a specific subset of data from a table. Well, that's where the WHERE clause comes in. And the WHERE clause allows you to filter your data by whatever criteria you choose. So let's say I want to find all the terminated employees at Craptech. Well, there is a terminated column in the employee database. Zero is a current employee and one is terminated. So I just need to say select from employee where terminated equals one. And this gets me a list of terminated employees. Okay, now you wanna see something really cool. You can even chain some of these queries together. So let's say I wanna get a list of all current employees who make over $100,000 a year. Well, change the terminated to zero, so they're still employees, and type in and salary, which is right here. Salary is greater than or equal to 100,000. And here's a list of all employees who are current and make over $100,000 a year. Hey, you can even do this with strings. Let me show you. Uh, let's say we want to get a list of everyone with the last name of Macbeth. So I'm just going to say select from employee where last name, like, we're not going to use equals, we're going to use like, and I'm going to put this in quotes, Macbeth. All right, let's hit F5. Boom, here's a list of every employee with Macbeth as their last name. And you can even use wildcards. Let's say I wanna find everyone whose last name starts with MC. So I can just use a wildcard, which in this case is a percent sign. And that gives me everybody named Macbeth and everybody named Mick Walking Target. So put a pin in that, that could be an interview question. The difference between like and equals is that like allows wildcards. Now, if you look at the database, every single employee has a job code. And this job code is matched to a table under employee type. So uh, Ryan is a software architect and Circle Back Jack is a project manager and Rayanne is a testing team lead. Now, one of the things that makes SQL so powerful is that I can actually join these tables. Now, there's many, many different kinds of joins, as you can see here. And if you just type in SQL join Venn diagram, you'll get a lot of examples on the internet. But probably the most famous is something called an inner join. So an inner join is going to be everything that's in table A and table B. This is basically how you call out to look up tables. So I'm going to use this common job code that exists in both the employee table and the employee type table to get the job name next to the first name and last name using an inner join. So one of the things I like to do whenever I do a join is I take both tables I intend to join and I do a select. And that way both tables are right next to each other and I can kind of see what I'm doing. Now I'm gonna join on the job code. So the job code and employee is gonna be joined on the job code and employee type. So in order to do this inner join, I'm gonna say select from employee, inner join, employee type on employee, dot job code equals employee type dot job code. Now, if we hit F5, you'll see both tables are joined and the software architect is in the same table. Now, if you want to clean this up a little bit, you can just say job name, comma, first name, comma, last name, and then this will give you a refined list of the job name, the first name, and the last name of everybody who works for Crap Tech. Now, I want to show you how to do this because there's a very good chance that during an interview, you'll be asked to do an inner join on a whiteboard. And if you don't know how to do it, it's really going to trip you up. So I actually have a mnemonic that I use. Special Forces in Jawbreaker Oakleys. 
Now, you know how Special Forces guys wear these cool guy Oakley Jawbreaker sunglasses, these glasses here? Well, just remember the mnemonic, Special Forces in Jawbreaker Oakleys. Or select from whatever table, enter join the second table on that first table's pivot value and that second table's pivot value. Now, if you find yourself doing a lot of joins, you can actually create a special kind of virtual table that's made up of one or more joined conventional tables. This is called a view. Now, you might do this in order to restrict permissions on what people can see. For example, you might allow employees to view the first name and last name of employees, but not view salary. Okay, so let's take the code we just wrote and we'll turn this into a view that'll just show the job name, the first name, and the last name, and we'll call it employee duties. Uh, and it'll be for all active employees. So the first thing we need to do is where terminated equals zero. That'll give us only current employees. And we're going to say create view uh, employee duties as this text down here. And when we run this, we create the view. Now, if you want to see the views in SQL Server Management Studio, just go to your database and click on views and the views are right here. If you want to actually do a select from the views, select star from employee duties. And this should give you the same exact data as you got in this select statement here. Now you probably won't be asked to create a view during an interview, but know that views are virtual tables that are made up of one or more conventional tables. And it's usually used to restrict access to these conventional tables. So now that you know a view is essentially a select statement that you've stored inside your database for later use, are you able to store other commands inside your database for later use? And you can, these are called stored procedures. Now, stored procedures are really fast because they're pre-compiled and optimized and cached. And it is totally common to see stored procedures that were written 20 years ago and they're still running just fine. Now, stored procedures have gotten a bad reputation because a lot of times business logic slowly tends to creep into stored procedures. And this can make them really hard to debug. And if, let's say, you add a column to a database table, now you got to rewrite the whole stored procedure. But for things that will essentially never change, like a password reset or a search of a database table with customized where clauses, store procedures really shine. Now you can find your store procedures by going to the database and going down to programmability. From there, you can open up store procedures and you can see here there is an update password store procedure. If you wanna see the parameters on it, it takes the new password and it takes the employee ID. So let me show you how to actually run a store procedure in SQL. Okay, so I'm going to do a select from employee where the first name is Ryan. I'm going to update the password, this store procedure here, update password, uh, with my new password being somersault and on the employee ID 100. And then I'm going to do another select from employee to prove to you that the password was updated. So let's do an execute. All right, so I take a look at the employee ID. As you can see, my password starts out as this encrypted hash value. And after I run the executable, the password is now somersault. Now, if you wanna see what the store procedure is actually doing, you can actually go to the store procedure, uh, in this case, update password, right click and choose modify. And this is gonna give you the actual text of the store procedure. So you can see here, it's just a simple update statement, update uh, employee, set the password to the new password that you pass in, where the employee ID is whatever you passed in. Now, you probably won't be asked to create a stored procedure, but just know that the advantages of stored procedures are speed and its long-lasting lifespan, and the disadvantages are that sometimes business logic creeps its way into the stored procedure where it's really hard to debug. Now, functions are similar to stored procedures in the sense that they are stored code, but functions can't perform any environmental changes. So you can't do an insert or an update or a delete with a function. Now there's many different kinds of functions, scalar, inline, multi-statement functions, but for the most part, if you're asked about functions in an interview, they're probably asking about scalar functions, which normally take one or more parameters and return a single value. And usually it's a mathematical value that you return. So let's say we wanna calculate a pay raise. We're gonna create a function that takes the current salary and the percentage pay raise, and it gets us back the dollar amount of the pay raise. Now, I've already created the scalar function. So let's go to crap tech, uh, programmability, functions, and it's a scalar function. And as you can see right here, we have calculate raise. 
if I right click and select modify, you can see what the function actually does. It passes salary as a float, raise amount as a float, and multiplies the salary times the raise amount. Okay, so let's see this in action. So we're gonna create a new query and I'm going to drop in here this calculate raise function. If I hit execute, you'll see that $2,000 comes back from a 2% raise on $100,000. Now what's really neat is I can actually use these functions inside of select statements or store procedures. So let's say I want to get a list of all the raises for all the employees. Well, I can just do a new query and I can select the first name, the last name, and then I can call out to this function using the salary from the employee as a parameter in my function, give everybody a 2% raise, and let's see what happens. All right, so here's all the employees, and here's all the raises for the year. Well, I'm sure you're kind of seeing the power here, and I bet you're thinking, like, this is awesome, and wouldn't it be great to automatically run something when something changes in the database? And you can do that with triggers. Now, triggers are essentially store procedures that are attached to a certain table and do something upon insert, update, or delete. You probably won't be asked to create a trigger, but you might be asked why triggers are useful. Let me show you. So if I go to the CrapTech database, you'll notice these three tables, employee, employee type, and password history. Now, if I actually do a select on password history, you'll see that there is an old password that was put into that table fairly recently, just a couple of minutes ago. And that was when I performed my password update. And here's how that happened. On the employee table, there is a trigger called employee password change. Now here's how this works. If I right click on the trigger employee password change and select modify, you'll see that the trigger exists on the DBL employee. And after I update, I insert into this separate table, password history, the employee ID, the old password, and the date changed. If you've ever wondered how a company knows your password history, it's probably from a trigger that is automatically takes your old password and puts it into a separate database when you change your password. Okay, so let's see how a trigger actually works. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna update the password on employee 100, which is Ryan, to uh, chainsaw as a new password and you should see everything fall into place. Just watch. Okay, and as you can see, Ryan's old password was Somersault, and the password history table had the old password in there from the previous example when I ran the store procedure. I run the store procedure, as you can see up here. His new password is now Chainsaw, but the old password of Somersault now goes into the password history database. So you can see how useful triggers are. If you ever want to put a trigger on a database when somebody logs in to capture some kind of information, or save information when something is deleted, you can do that with a trigger. And it's so easy and works forever. Now, none of the stuff we did matters if you can't find your data. And this is where clustered and non-clustered indexes come in. Now, a clustered index defines the way the data is physically stored in the table. You can only have one of them per table. And typically, when you actually create a table, you create a primary key. And this primary key is the clustered index. Non-clustered indexes don't physically separate the data. Instead, they create a separate table that's kind of attached to the table. Let me show you. So if you go to the CrapTech database and open up tables and go to the employee table, you can find the non-clustered indexes under indexes. And as you can see, I created an employee salary non-clustered index on the uh, employee table. So now as the company grows, searching by salary will be a lot faster because this is indexed in a separate table. And you can have as many of these non-clustered indexes as you want, but just keep in mind, as you create non-clustered indexes, you're also adding to database space and overhead. A good way of remembering the differences with a book. A clustered index is sort of like the table of contents of a book where everything is in order. A non-clustered index is kind of like the bibliography of a book where you can get an index of where to find the different citations inside the book. Now, you probably won't be asked to create a clustered or non-clustered index, but one of the questions you might get asked is, how would you speed up a database? And the answer to that would be indexes, either clustered indexes from the start or non-clustered indexes if you find yourself searching for things in certain ways. Now, you might be asked, what's a way to peek in at the database to see what it's doing? Or what's a good way to debug the database? And the answer to that is SQL Server Profiler. To get to Profiler, go up to Tools and select SQL Server Profiler. Now, when this window pops up, log in. 
and you're probably going to get a trace properties window pop up. Just hit run. Now, I want to show you what's going to happen in this when I hit execute on this select from employee. SQL Server Profiler kind of acts as a real-time log. So it records the fact that I said select from employee. So if you're running store procedures or you're running Entity Framework from C Sharp, you can actually peek in at what's actually going on inside the database. And as you can imagine, this is really, really helpful for debugging. Now, one more thing. You might be asked, what is a SQL injection attack? That could be a video by itself. But essentially, a SQL injection attack is when someone uses form fields and SQL commands embedded inside the form fields. And if you're not checking for commands that are inside your form fields, you could subject yourself to an injection attack. So if you're ever asked, how do you prevent a SQL injection attack? Say validation, parameterized queries, and store procedures. Your software should be able to tell that this is not a valid user. So that should be the basics of a C-sharp full stack developer SQL portion of an interview. If you take anything away from this, Please remember how to do an inner join, special forces in, jawbreaker, Oakleys. And please remember the difference between a clustered and a non-clustered index. Where the clustered index is actually physically on the table, and the non-clustered index is a separate table that's on a specific column in the table. Good luck on your next interview. I'm here. See, Mr. Big, this is what happens when you go to too many meetings.